Black, Spiff Whitfield in Second Life. We are here at the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium's Eduverse, which is new to Second Life. It is a place just really for education and educators, so come on out and try a Second Life account if you'd like. With me today is my fellow avatar and colleague, and that is Jennifer Vandiver in Real Life and Willow Esther in Second Life. Thank you for joining me, uh, Willow. And a little bit about Jennifer slash Willow is uh, she lives in Indiana and works as an adjunct psychology professor for Ivy Tech Community College. She teaches uh, introduction to psychology courses. She has a background which includes psychology, sociology, and philosophy. She's currently working on her doctorate in educational psychology. She's been a resident of Second Life for nine years and has been fascinated with all aspects of virtual worlds, and her dissertation is interested in the experiences of educators who teach in Second Life at the post-secondary level. Jennifer, thank you for joining me. And question number one, what is your favorite blend of coffee? White chocolate mocha from oh. Starbucks. Okay, so let's dig into this topic of education in virtual worlds. I've been a part of Second Life for a while with the Virtual Pioneers, which is a history group. Been active in that. I also have done some open sim stuff with students. But let's dig into your background. So you're doing your dissertation on teaching in virtual worlds. Let's dig into that. What's your experience so far? Um, well, I haven't taught using virtual worlds. Um, that's on my to-do list. Um, hopefully I can convince where I work to open that door for me and get some funding and, and start teaching introductory psychology courses using Second Life. But um, that's down the road a little bit. First, I have to do the dissertation and, and see how much interest I can uh, drum up with my, my chair and the rest of my faculty members to see if they'll be interested. Um, but the research I've been doing uh, is interested in those educators that have used Second Life in some capacity to teach higher education. And there are so many great educators that I've come across in Second Life. And just so far, kind of the sneak preview of what I found out uh, with the interviews that I've done thus far is that networking is a huge component. I know that networking, we don't really think about that when we're talking about our students, but when we're talking about other faculty members and doing collaborative work, Second Life is the place to be for that because you can reach out to people on a global scale and that can just make your research that much more impactful. Um, and then Second Life, I've heard coming up, it, you know, coming down the chain of interviews is it's not the end all it, when it comes to teaching. It's more like an educational tool in a toolbox that we have. So don't think of it as that's the only um, educational medium that we can use for our students. It's something that sort of complements an already well-created curriculum. Um, I think I think that's a good point to take, you know, a takeaway when it comes to the research I'm doing because Second Life has been reported to be overwhelming and have a huge learning curve. But if we think of it in more than baby steps, that you can add it to something that you've already been teaching for a while, it becomes a lot less overwhelming um, for educators that way. And you have to be sure that Second Life um, meets your educational needs and your teaching methodology too. Um, there's been a gap, there's gaps in the research about a theoretical foundation. What do we use in a virtual world? What's the best practices that we should be following? And virtual words aren't new, but the concept of teaching it and getting institutional backing and having a best practices, um, it, it all is something that we're slowly becoming, you know, a little bit more familiar with. And we're trying to kind of get all of our ducks in the row so that we can teach students more effectively. But those are just a few things that so far, patterns, themes, categories that have kind of popped up in my research so far. So I really liked, uh, Jennifer, how you framed it in a sense that that Second Life or virtual worlds in general can be an enhancement to teaching, not the end all be all. And I think, you know, over the few years we've lived through, uh, you know, what's known as Zoom fatigue of teaching in an online platform, 
even though it's different and unique and it, and it has power, I think we've also seen that that it can be you know, over overkill, I guess, for lack of a better term. So you are kind of framing for thinking uh, in terms of an enhancement. Is that kind of where you, you see this going? Yes, 100%. Um, that it's not the whole the whole shebang is not in here it's it's more there's some portion of their their curriculum whatever discipline that they're teaching let's say it's a you know a nursing program and maybe you have nursing students that that need to develop a certain skill set be extra technology and they don't have enough spots on campus well you can come in here have a virtual campus and you can do a simulation and they can do those x-ray you know build those x-ray skills in here and that kind of helps too when there are you know too many people in classes you know nurses they would like to graduate but sometimes they get held back because there's not enough room for them in courses um so yeah i mean it's it's something that adds to it it's an, like i like your word enhancement it's something that complements an already you know well created curriculum so from the teachers that you've talked to so far what are their key takeaways that you found? Well, their main takeaway, I think, is they like the idea that they have the ability to collaborate with others, but they also like the ability to, um, one, they can build things and that the students, they can teach the students to build things. And it's um, student-centered learning or experiential learning. My theory that I'm my dissertation is founded on is social constructivism. So it's how we all socially construct knowledge between our interactions with one another and hands-on experiences in the environment. So if you have a good curriculum, I mean, I can give you another example of perhaps um, someone that's in business administration or marketing. You can come in here, Second Life has its own economy with Linden's and the Second, market, Second Life Marketplace. If you have that group of students and you're wanting to teach them, you know, marketing skills and business skills, you can have them build things, you know, clothes or simple objects and try to open a store and they can try to, you know, their hand at being a business and an entrepreneur. So that would be like one piece of the overall course. It would be the hands-on portion of it because you can't send those students out into the real world and say, all right, open your own business for six or eight weeks, but we can do it in Second Life. So that kind of gives you an edge um, as far as teaching them that way. And I feel like that's something that educators want to take advantage of. That's that's the enhancement part that Second Life can provide. Um, where the real world is lacking, Second Life can pick up the slack. I'm going to have you maybe put on your prediction hat for a moment, Jen. And just, you know, I know... I've been in kind of tried using virtual worlds in education for quite some time. And I know one of the biggest challenges is the learning curve of most virtual worlds with this renewed energy here at VWEC and beyond. Do you see, or even, you know, meta is becoming uh, bigger. Do you see virtual worlds in education catching on finally? And where do you think we're going with it? I'm optimistic that it will take off. I think if anything, um, the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic thrust us into a different time in education. It's, we were already headed in that general direction, but now it, it's the fourth industrial revolution. So it's all about virtual worlds and virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, the metaverse and Facebook and, and them just trying to really thrust everybody into the future when it comes to social networking and just social interactions and I think I don't want to say second life's going to be the end all for that I think it's a fantastic sandbox for that to find out what works and what doesn't work and I think maybe later on there's going to be better virtual worlds that will enhance the learning even better for students and help educators make that transition easier I think so what I hear you saying is you're pretty optimistic about virtual worlds catching on, Second Life being one of them. Are there some other virtual worlds you looked into, and what are your thoughts? I have, um, I've been, I've been into OpenSim. I have been through VR Chat, um, Roblox, um, 
science base um, and all of, I mean they've all they all have pros and cons to them um, I had an, an educator talk to me about um, unity which I have not had the opportunity to check out and it that one has had rave reviews I don't know where it's at um, right now because I haven't had time to do the research on it but yes I've been into different um, different virtual worlds, I mean, Verbella, Mozilla Hubs, all of those, they have their pros and cons. But again, it kind of goes back to what the educators are telling me that it's, it is need specific. What do you need to use a virtual world for in your curriculum? Because it's not a good fit for everybody. If there's something that you want to teach to your students and then you want to make it impactful and you want to make it immersive, then Second Life would probably be your best bet. So is that where you're seeing most educators are at this point in Second Life? Yeah, I think that it's best to see it as a complement. It's complementary to something that you already have. I don't like, I mean, I don't, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of going around in a circle, but it's not mm -hmm. the end of all of everything when it comes to education. It is a tool that we're going to use. And I think that in five to 10 years, those tools, as far as technology goes, will change too. Um, who knows, maybe five to 10 years from now, we'll have holograms and our professors will, you know, be in our, our rooms, our bedrooms, our living rooms, and there'll be a hologram and we'll be able to listen to them teach that way. We don't even have to leave our house. Um, but you know, it's a little far-fetched, but maybe it will happen. So you mentioned VR. Have you checked into VR at all? And what are your thoughts? I'm ashamed to say that I haven't checked out VR, um, mostly because of cost and time. But I have looked up a few things about it, and the Oculus seems to be a big deal. And I know that Facebook or Meta, whatever you want to say, is, is trying their darndest to profit off of different forms of equipment that they can use. Um, but I haven't used it personally. Um, honestly, the last time that I played anything that I would consider a video game would be like Duck Hunt or Mario Brothers. So that kind of just dated me. <laughs> <age -wise. laughs> um, but that's as um, gamer-ish as I am. <laughs> I think that as far as cost goes, if you're talking about education, you're going to worry about cost for students. You're going to worry about their disabilities and whether or not they can um, use the uh, products or the virtual reality equipment effectively. Or, I mean, because... Anything has an opportunity to become successful, but it also has an equal opportunity to become something that's impairing learning and you don't ever want to impair learning. So I think virtual reality is something that deserves a lot of research into before we say everybody has to have it because not everybody is going to have the means to have it. So that kind of discriminates against some of our students too. I'm going to have you maybe change hats and put on your psychology hat for a moment. Virtual worlds and also you could say VR are so immersive, but they also allow you creativity and avatars. You can really be almost whoever you want to be. What are your thoughts as far as mental health possibilities, positives and negatives? Where are you as far as how virtual worlds are kind of uh, interacting with society at large? The education side, I think that it's a more controlled environment. I mean, it's going to be more, you know, G-rated than um, the social side. There's um, a lot of research out there about students that do get distracted because they become semi-obsessed with what their avatar looks like. And the customization of the avatar becomes the goal instead of whatever their learning outcomes are for the course. Um, but that happens in such a small percentage that I, I don't see that being that impactful on, on student learning. But on the flip side, um, in the less controlled environments, which students can get into, you know, the adult rated SIMS, the moderate SIMS, I mean, they are adults. I'm dealing with college level students. They just kind of need that disclaimer of, you know, it's the like the internet. If you want to find it, it will be here. Um, uh, but from a psychological perspective, I think Second Life fulfills a lot of needs for people that they don't get in their everyday life. But sometimes it can also, I've had research, read research where it can become addictive, where there's, you know, people that are on it 10 or 12 
hours a day and then they take a break and then they come right back. So I think it has to do with personality a lot. What What is that person looking for? What do they need out of Second Life? And I think that that really kind of defines whether or not it's a healthy environment for them or not. I mean, a lot of good things can come out of it. There's virtual ability island. So, you know, there's people that can't walk or people that can't, you know, maneuver well, and they can come in here and they can walk and dance and, you know, run and fly. So, I mean, it has um, immense possibilities for positive gains, but I mean, everything, there's always a bad side to stuff. So this is part one of our interview, and I'm going to have you come back after you've done your dissertation and your research. I guess, what's your hypothesis at this point or your predictions based on your uh, dissertation research? Or can't you say? My predictions, um, well, I already kind of came into it. I, I don't like saying I have a prediction because the kind of research I'm doing is emergent. So basically what that means is that the solution to the phenomenon or the the question that I'm asking is going to make itself known through the analysis of the data. So the only thing that I really have that I think is, I can say that's predicted is that I believe that social constructivism is going to be the main foundational theory that educators will use and they'll use it in one way or another. Um, just from the pattern of my interviews thus far, um, social networking is playing a lot larger component than I expected. And I kind of expected Second Life to, to be a tool and not the end all. But I didn't expect the, the, the social networking portion of it so much when it came to educators. I don't know if maybe I just overlooked that portion of it or um, I'm not really good at social networking. I tend to be slightly shy. So maybe, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that was a form of blinders I had on. But I do, I can predict that it will be a lot of work because I have several participants and I'm going through the transcription stage right now. And um, when you transcribe things, you know, it's a two hour interview and that two hours turns into maybe three and a half or four to make sure everything is right. So just getting through the transcription process is, is difficult. Okay, so that gave us a lot of food for thought for when we come back to chat again after your dissertation. So it is now time for the infamous Speed Geek question. So these are light, lively, and hopefully just can be quick, short answers. The first one we're going to go with is, what's your favorite social network? My favorite social network. It was Facebook for a time, and then, I don't know, it just became so drama-ridden that you couldn't, I couldn't post anything without someone else having a hissy fit about it. So I... <laughs> I mean, I, I ended up just getting rid of Facebook. Um, so, but it used to be Facebook. I loved it because um, my friends from high school scattered out everywhere and I didn't know where half of them were. So Facebook helped me find several of them, but they changed a lot over the years. So, Yeah, I think that is the challenge of social networks is, uh, especially some of the political discourse can be pretty challenging. So let's dig into another Speed Geek question. And this is a challenging one. What is your favorite educational blog? Oh, okay. So this is the second time I get to say I'm ashamed. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't have one. Um, I, my nose has been in article, you know, scholarly articles and textbooks. And I have not really had time to have an educational blog at all. <laughs> I mean, I have to look. <laughs> I know there should be one out there that I'm probably interested in, but um, I don't have one yet. I will soon, I'm sure, but I All have right. not right now. Well, I did tell you that was a challenging one, and that's not the first person to be stumped by it. I would say if you're looking for some maybe uh, virtual world blogs, I know that Jane, or Wagner James Ow has a what's known as New World Notes. That's a really good one. And Selby Evans has Virtual Outworlding. He does a lot of great stuff with the virtual world. So check that out. And our final question is, what's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Oh, nature. Nature. I love to be outdoors. Um, 
Uh, I live out in the country, so we have this cool little space where we can sit in the morning and have an early cup of coffee. And there's, you know, cornfields or soybeans, whatever they happen to plant, you know, this year. But you get to sit there and you can see deer and other wildlife come out and eat in the field and enjoy your hot cup of coffee. So that's always nice. That seems like a healthy outlet. Let me throw one last one at you. What was your first storage device? Your gaming. Oh, my first storage device. <laughs> um, okay, so floppy the, I, disk. Um... It would be a floppy disk because I was. Um, I'm an '80s baby, so when the Apple computers came out in the Oregon Trail, I was um, an Oregon Trail ninja. So <laughs> <laughs> I was so nice. good at that game. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you've, you've, I'm way past you. I started off with cassette tapes, believe it or not. So, oh. so feel good. Okay. Yay. Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate your time. I'm looking forward to hearing your uh, dissertation results, which I think are coming out in the spring. So we've got a little time. Good luck with that. Keep in touch and uh, can't wait to see you around the metaverse.